so, um, so again, thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. So what we're going to do today, um, I'm, I'm going to try to do this as fast as I can so that we can actually eat. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about, since it's Christmas, we're going to talk about who is Jesus. Okay. It's so basic, right? But I think it's actually one of the most, uh, mo one of the most uh, important message that we should actually hear. It's something about who is what? Jesus. In our, in our in symposia, we've been actually looking at the Gospel of Mark. And in the Gospel of Mark, it's about Jesus. So, so we've been actually talking about Jesus since September 9. Okay? So we're going to continue with that. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read from the Gospel of Matthew. Okay? So we're going to read from the Gospel of Matthew. But, but first, I want to thank, you know, the group. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we started like about four months ago. And, you know, and I think the group is just beginning to have a life of its own. And I think I'm excited about that. When the group is actually beginning to have a life of its own, that, that's a good thing in, in a way, right? I'm thankful for the people who opened the house for today, the De La Fuente family, right? I'm thankful for the cook, okay, especially Sister Bambi. Okay, thank you so much. And the people who organized the service for today. As a matter of fact, I didn't even organize it. It was weird, right, that I, I was actually, what, in some sense, I'm not even part of the organization. People are just doing, the, doing it themselves, like with, uh, with Gene. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful for their worship team. Okay, thank you, guys. And, you know, people are beginning to have ownership of the group, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, and that is how it's supposed to be. The less of me, the less of Gene, the better. That's what the church is supposed to be, right? Okay. Now, uh, almost... Every single one of the active attendees of, of Symposia, in some sense, right, um, in some sense are doing something, right, uh, for, 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 for the group. Either they're bringing food, they're doing something, right? So that's a, that's a fun thing to see. Um, you know, I am proud of that, and I'm excited about what God has in store for Symposia. You know, a church should be a place where your spiritual gifts, your talent, your skills are used in harmony with each other. One of our tasks as leaders is to figure out how to harmonize the exercises of those what? The exhibitions of those gifts, the exhibitions of those talents, okay? Now, and uh, I'd like to actually want to thank uh, Brother Rainier for what he actually messaged us like last week. I think it was last week when he said in the message uh, through me Messenger, he said, do not despise humble beginnings. Do not despise what? Humble beginnings. Actually, after I read that, I was actually encouraged. Because we are actually having a humble what? Beginning. It's a humble beginning. Okay? So, so let's read uh, Matthew 16 here. Uh, from uh, verses 13 to 17. It says, Now, uh, is it pretty clear? It's okay. Um, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, see, who do people say that, that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Um, and Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. You guys got that? Uh, we have a very short passage for today. Uh, usually we, we study the whole chapter. But I know some people, a lot of people will be coming who are new. I don't want to bore you with like, you know, reading a whole chapter from, from, from the Bible. So we're going to actually focus our attention on that. Okay? So Christmas is about Jesus, right? Whether we like it or not. Christmas is about what? Jesus. Now, obviously, Christmas is about Jesus. It should not be too much for people to attend a Christmas service during the busiest week of the, of, 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 of the year, uh, considering that Christmas is actually about what? About Jesus. Now, so the most appropriate Christmas message should be about what? About Jesus. Now, I hate cliches, okay? Uh, when people say Jesus is the reason for the season. Uh, but actually, that's actually true. Okay, Jesus is actually what? The reason for the season. So people around the world celebrate Jesus' birthday on Christmas. Now, despite 
the unnecessary extravagances in our celebration of his birthday, I somehow think that they keep the legacy of Jesus alive in a grand way. This is, that's why this is the most popular holiday, right? Because for some reason, people are actually celebrating this in a, in a very extravagant way. But in some sense, that actually sustains right, the legacy of the birthday of what? Of Jesus. Now, Jesus is possibly the most unknown among the most well-known. Jesus is possibly what? The most unknown out of, uh, of among, among the most what? Well-known. He is probably the most well-known figure, but at the same time, I think he is the most what? Unknown out of all uh, those who are actually well-known. Now, many people seem to think that they really know who Jesus is. We are so familiar with all sorts of stories about him. But whether we like it or not, we see those stories through all sorts of what? Culturally and historically conditioned lenses. Do you guys follow me here? We see Jesus in many different what? Many different ways. Right? Because whether we like it or not, somehow our understanding of who Jesus is is always conditioned by our culture. It's conditioned by our history. Now, um, and somehow those lenses that we use in order to actually view Jesus probably distorts in some sense, distort in some sense how we actually what? Perceive him. So probably how we perceive him is different from the Jesus of history or the Jesus in reality or in actuality. Okay. Now, there are no, so here's the thing, okay? There are no actual and accurate historical records about the Jesus of history. Let's just face that, okay? Uh, Jesus did not write a book about his life and teachings. Do you guys know that? Jesus is like Socrates, right? Uh, they both did not write, they probably, uh, Nietzsche once said that they're actually the greatest teachers in the world too, Jesus and, and, and Socrates. But the problem is that they did not write a book about their what? Their teachings. So we don't really know what exactly they said. Okay? So we, we're, we're merely gleaning from the disciples, you know, biased accounts of his life in order to understand who he was, in order for us to understand who he is. That's what we're trying to do here. Okay? Now, so the question is this. Who is Jesus? That may sound like a trivial question, but that is actually a worthwhile question to ask, especially during this season. I hope I'm making sense here, right? Uh, that is probably what? A trivial question to ask, but that is probably the most worthwhile, especially during the season. Who is Jesus? So let me analyze the text, okay, really quick here. Um, Jesus said in Matthew, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man simply means a human being. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, it simply means that it actually means Something about, you know, um, uh, uh, someone who will come to reign eternally, okay, in, in, in the book of Daniel, okay. Um, and when you look at Peter's response, Peter also referred to Jesus as what? The son of the living God, right? Now, what does that mean, the son of the living God? Again, it also refers to the one who's supposed to come, right, to actually restore Israel ultimately, Okay, that's what it means. The Son of Man, you know, Jesus said, he asked his disciples, who do people say uh, that uh, uh, the Son of Man is, referring to himself? Okay? Now, so let me look at another one here. So who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, I think Jesus was actually concerned about people's first impressions of, of him. What do people think about me? Right? Probably Jesus was wondering about that. Okay? Um, the question can imply that Jesus was aware of the misunderstandings about him. Probably, Jesus was aware that people actually what? Misunderstood who he really is. Uh, they couldn't go beyond the cultural and historical conditions that led to such misunderstandings. Why is it the case that people during that time misunderstood Jesus in some sense? Because somehow their cultural historical conditions limit their perspective so that they cannot really understand who Jesus really was. 
right? They didn't really see the grand the, the grandness of 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 Jesus's calling. They actually thought that Jesus was actually only called for what? For 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 Israel. Right? Okay? Now the question is possibly the occasion for Jesus to reveal who he really was. What he wanted to show them is that Jesus is actually beyond all of our cultural and historical conditions. There's something about Jesus that is actually independent of our cultural perceptions of Jesus. There's something about Jesus that is actually that something that transcends our historical understanding of who Jesus really is. Right? I hope I'm making sense here. Right? Now, um, for the disciples, because they were first century Jews, they really thought Jesus was a prophet. You know, for now, you know, we don't really know anybody who's a prophet, right? I'm assuming, uh, th- th- does anybody here who know anybody who's a prophet? Right, so, so if Jesus will ask us, who do, you really, who do you think that I am? Probably none of us will actually look at Jesus and say, hey, you're a prophet. Because for the most part, we don't really know what a prophet is. We don't, we don't really call anybody who's a prophet. I, I know there are some churches who will call some people prophets, but we don't really know them. Do you guys follow me here? Right? This is not part, part of our... Um, um, uh, what, what, what do you call this? This is not part of our um, uh, cultural con- culturally conditioned identification of who Jesus is, in some sense. Because again, once again, we don't have that category of prophet prominent in our way of what? Thinking. Okay? But for them, they thought Jesus was a prophet. Okay? Jesus was a prophet, despite the fact that many of them during that time believed that somehow the prophets already ceased. Do you guys know that Malachi is the last, chap- the last book in the Old Testament, and Matthew is what? The first book in the New Testament. And there's about 300 years uh, span between the two. Many people in, the, in, in Israel during that time thought that actually the prophets ceased to exist. Right? There were no prophets for a long time, for probably 200, 300 years. So that's why it's somehow ironic that when Jesus asked them, who do people think that I am? Many people thought he was what? A prophet. Okay. So some people said that, that he was uh, uh, John the Baptist. Remember, during this time, John the Baptist is already what? Dead. And some people thought that he will, he will resurrect John the Baptist. And they thought Jesus is what? The resurrected John the Baptist. Some people said that, oh, he must be Elijah. Elijah is the prophet who did not die in the Old Testament. And, and they thought that he would actually come back and return, right? And somehow do some miraculous works. And they thought that was actually Jesus. And some people thought he was Jeremiah. Why? Because Jeremiah's uh, uh, judgment oracles are very similar to, to Jesus. So they're trying to actually what? Refer to their what? Cultural figures, right? And they try to identify Jesus based on their understanding of those what? Cultural figures. Now... After Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? He asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Not the other people, but what? Who do you say that I am? Now, after being with the disciples for a while, I assume that Jesus expected them to have better understanding of the real identity of Jesus. I, I, I'm assuming Jesus was what? Expecting that. Right? That probably the disciples must know me well, right? Better than how the other people actually what? Know me. Okay? That's probably what he was thinking. But let's look at Peter's response here. Peter said, so initially, his response was actually, will appear as correct. Because Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of what? The living God. That sounds like it's correct. As a matter of fact, Jesus, for, uh, uh, Jesus even actually thought that actually what? Peter was correct in actually identifying him as what? The Messiah and the son of the living God. So in a way, Peter identified the correct title of Jesus. Initially, Jesus appeared to consider it as correct. Now, why do I keep on saying initially? Because later on in the text, we will see, it turns out Peter was actually wrong. Peter was actually what? Wrong. He actually, in his mind, even though he's using the correct title, in his mind, he actually does not understand what a Messiah really is about. He doesn't know what what that actually means. Okay? And I I wanted to show you this. Okay? Remember Jesus said, 
This must have been something that must be revealed to you by my father. This is not something that flesh and blood can reveal to you. This is something miraculous that you actually saw me as what? The coming Messiah, right? There's something unique about that, that identification of Jesus. But why is it the case that Peter was actually mistaken? Do you guys follow, what I, do you guys follow where I'm going here? Why is it the case that Peter was mistaken? Isn't, that, isn't it the case that it sounds correct to say that Jesus is the Messiah? Of course, Peter's response was better than the other responses. Other people said he's, uh, Jesus is just a mere prophet. But Peter said, no, you're the Messiah. Uh, so that's a better answer in some sense. But even Peter was also mistaken about his understanding of Jesus' real identity. He didn't really understand Jesus' what? Real identity. How do we know that? In Matthew 16, 21 to 23, and, and we're not going to read it anymore, uh, Jesus revealed to them about his impending sufferings, uh, his uh, death, and his resurrection. So Jesus was talking to them, and he says, time will come, I will actually what? I will actually suffer, I will, I will, I will die, and I will resurrect again from the dead. If you notice, Peter approached Jesus, and he rebuked Jesus. And he said, what the heck are you talking about? Right? What do you mean? That you are actually going to what? Die. Right? There's something weird about this. No. Uh, but Jesus responded to Peter and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? Uh, you are a stumbling block for me. Okay? Because Jesus said, um, He said, uh, For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, what I want you to actually see here is this. Okay. I hope you guys are still here with me. We're almost done. Okay. It turns out, in Peter's mind, when he said that Jesus was actually the Messiah, he thought Jesus is what? A political Messiah. <laughs> That's what he was thinking. That's why when Jesus told him, I'm going to be suffering and I will be dying and I will be resurrecting from the dead, Peter rebuked him and said, what the heck are you talking about? I thought we're going to what? Rule Israel. Right? That's what he was thinking. He was thinking of Jesus as a political what? Messiah. He didn't see him as a spiritual Messiah. That was the misunderstanding of what? That was the misunderstanding of Peter. Because he thought that Jesus is the one who will actually rescue them from the Roman Empire. That's what he was thinking. So even Peter, after being with Jesus for so long, still did not recognize who exactly is what? Jesus. I hope I'm making sense here. You guys are following me here? Okay. Uh, I hope I'm not boring you guys here, right? We're almost done. Okay. Um, so in a way, Peter actually misunderstood, uh, misunderstood Jesus, right? Um, now, so Jesus through the centuries... Uh, Yaroslav Pelikan actually wrote a book with the following title, Jesus Through the Centuries. And this is what he said. He's a Yale professor of, of religion. And he said something like this. Uh, I'm just summarizing what he said here in the whole book. Okay, in the whole book. Um, he said, Jesus was a rabbi for first century Jews, light of the Gentiles for the first Gentile converts, the king of kings after the conversion of, the emperor, of, of, of emperor Constantine, the cosmic Christ, in a world dominated by Platonism, the Son of Man, according to the Christian psychology and anthropology in 5th century, the true image that inspired the art and architecture in 8th century and 9th cent century, the Christ crucified in the Middle Ages, the monk who rules the world in the monastic period, the bridegroom of the soul for the mystics, the divine um, and human model for the Franciscans, the universal man in the Renaissance period, the mirror of the eternal in the Reformation period, the Prince of Peace during the wars of religion, the teacher of common sense in the Enlightenment period, the poet of the spirit in the Romantic period, the liberator during the period of the civil rights movement, the man who belongs to the world in the time of world evangelization. Do you guys see what I'm trying to point out here? Every single period in history understood Jesus differently. That's why it makes sense to ask the question, who is what? Who the heck is Jesus? Do you guys follow me? <laughs> who is Jesus? When we actually think about who is Jesus for us today, 
Is, is it the case that our understanding of Jesus is pretty much conditioned by our own history? Is it conditioned by our own culture? I hope I'm making sense here. Is that what's happening here? Right? Who do you say that Jesus is? For some, Jesus is like a cultural heirloom. <laughs> okay. That parents can pass on, right, uh, to their children, right? Isn't that, isn't that for some people that's what, who Jesus is? It's like a cultural heirloom, right? You just pass it on. Right? Make sure you tell your kids, right, about Jesus, okay? And make sure they actually go to church. But the problem with that understanding of Jesus is that it actually what? It extinguishes any kind of authenticity in our belief and in our faith in Jesus, right? Because it's just what? Something we inherited. Do you guys follow me here? Okay. For some, that is who Jesus is. For some, Jesus is like someone who monitors every single one of the needs and wants of every single follower and every single sinful act of every single human as if he has nothing better to do than worry about another person's worries, desires, and sinful acts. You know how some people think that you know, Jesus is just you know, caring about me every single moment of my life as if Jesus has nothing better to do than actually monitor right, whether we're actually sinning or not. <laughs> uh, I had a friend one time who said, what if Jesus come at the time when I'm actually sinning? And I, was, and I think I remember telling him, this was 20 years ago, I said, I don't even think really Jesus will really care. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like, oh, he's gonna, I'm going to come when you're not ready, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure you're, you're going to go to hell or something like that, right? Because they think of Jesus as someone who somehow what? monitors everything that happens to you every time you're in need. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. That's the image of Jesus that many people have, right? For some, Jesus is like a genie, right, who fulfills our wishes or guarantees our future as we compliment him through some flattering words. Do you guys follow me here, right? I say this because in, 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 the, you know, in, in the Philippines, you know, they, they're just a... The, the Filipino channel. I don't know probably some of you are familiar with that. Okay, the Filipino channel. And then when I watch those telenovelas, right, and there's some, some, there's sometimes they'll talk about Jesus in a very corny way. They will say, oh, Papa Jesus, right, uh, please help us out, right, because, uh, uh, you know, you're so, you're so good, Papa Jesus. I know you will bless me. And I thought that that would sound really weird, <laughs> okay. They, 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 they're, they're treating Jesus as if Jesus is like a genie in a bottle that you just have to, what, flatter, right? So that somehow Jesus will, what, will respond to you. I hope I'm making sense here. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, for some, Jesus is like a philanthropist, right, who wants to give, like, what, house and lot and all sorts of luxurious things in heaven to those who are nice and not give anything to those who are naughty. Like, oh, I'm going to do good works, right? Why? Because Jesus has a mansion for me in heaven, right? It's like, oh, Jesus is like a Santa Claus or something like that. And that that's seemingly the common image of Jesus that I've, I've found, you know, as, as I observe people when they actually say something about Jesus. You know, for some, Jesus is like a politically partisan hack who supports each agenda of a particular political party. Do you guys follow me here, right? You know, the understanding of Jesus is that Jesus the Republican or Jesus the Democrat. Whatever. Or Jesus the independent. Jesus the libertarian. Okay? Now, uh, for, for some, Jesus is a hater of everyone or everything that you hate. Do you guys following me here? Right? Sometimes we portray Jesus as a bigot. I hope I'm making sense here. Does that make sense? Okay? And that seemingly is our understanding of Jesus. Now, if you ask me, who do I say that Jesus is. And after this, we have one more slide and then we're done. Okay. Uh, I'm just getting you excited for the food. Okay. <laughs> what time is it now anyways? Okay, we're actually going to end uh, uh, early. Okay. Who do I say that Jesus is? Here's what I think. Okay. You can take it or not. Okay. Jesus is the one and only human embodiment of the divine presence on earth. Okay, he's what? The one and only human embodiment of what? 
divine presence on earth. So every relational quality of God, that is the qualities of God in relation to humans, was manifested in how he conducted his life and what he taught. Okay? Jesus revolutionized people's understandings of God in the ancient world. The God whom people thought as a tyrant who polices the world, their world became known as the God of love, the God of compassion, right? The God of mercy, the God of grace, the God of justice, the God of kindness, the God of truth. If you are actually living in the ancient world, you will not know God or you will not claim to know God in a way, you, know, you, you will claim to know God in a way that is very different from how you claim to know God now. Because during that time, they thought God was some kind of like a tyrant, right? Who polices what? The world. Who rewards the good and, you know, punish the bad. That is the conception of God. But somehow when Jesus came, Jesus revolutionized all that. What he, was, what he actually showed people is that God is the God of what? Love. The God of compassion. The God of grace. The God of mercy. The God of truth. The God of kindness. The God of justice. Jesus paved the way for the realization of God's redemptive task on earth by paving the way for moral, social, spiritual, and inter intellectual progress. Do you guys know that after Jesus, somehow the world actually what? Changed. Do you guys follow me here? After Jesus, the world actually what? Changed. Okay. Uh, there are even some atheistic uh, philosophers today who claim that even the democratic values that we have would not have been possible without the teachings of the church. Again, I'm not talking about, these are, these are not Christian people who are actually saying this. Uh, so some people, some historians even claim, um, uh, I can't remember his name now, uh, but he was, he's actually an Australian uh, historian of science. He said that somehow the teachings of Jesus or, the, or, or, or Christianity made scientific revolution somehow possible. Okay? The point I'm trying to make is that somehow the coming of Jesus actually changed what? The course of history. Okay? Now, um, through Jesus' revelatory role, he saved us from the superficialities of our moral, spiritual, and religious lives. For the most part, our moral, religious, and spiritual lives are very, very what? superficial. Remember, that's what the Pharisees were doing, right? I'm going to try to offer something for the temple, but I want to make sure that other people can see me, right? I want to do good for this person, right? Why? Because I want other people to praise me. So somehow, our religious, spiritual, and moral lives are very, very what? Superficial. And when Jesus came, he wanted to what? He destroyed that. Okay. He made it realize that you know our religious lives, our moral lives, our spiritual lives should not be that way. Okay. Now, uh, he also saves us from the illusoriness of all of our thoughts about God. When Jesus came, right, he actually changed the way we think about who God is. Do you guys follow me here? He was not the God who was actually longing for you to actually make sacrifices all the time. But it is the God who's actually longing for a relationship with you. It is a God who wants your obedience rather than your sacrifice. We realized that when Jesus came. Right? We realized that when Jesus came. So for those of us who received his message, Jesus broke the chains that put us in the bondages of spiritual blindness that put us in the chains of uh, bondages of selfishness, the bondages of legalism, the bondages of fears, the bondages of hatred, the bondages of our natural proclivities. Right? Jesus did that to set us all what? Free. Why? In order for us to live or to have you know, spiritually satisfying lives in our pursuits of God's kingdom. Amen? I hope you guys are following me here. <laughs> okay. Now, 
Jesus is the Messiah. Do you guys follow me? Jesus is what? The Messiah. Now, so here's my concluding remarks. So it is Christmas. Since it is Christmas, it is time to reflect on who Jesus is to us. It's time to reflect on how that understanding of Jesus corresponds to the biblical portrayal of his life and his teachings. Since it is Christmas, it is time to at least consider allowing Jesus to revolutionize your way of thinking and living. If you've been a Christian for so long, or if you claim to be a Christian for a very, very long time, and somehow your way of thinking and your way of life haven't been revolutionized by the message of Jesus, then something is wrong. Exactly. Because it's supposed to revolutionize our lives. Since it is Christmas, it is time to free ourselves from all of our misconceptions about Jesus. Merry Christmas from Symposia. Okay?